Welcome to the online sermon for Saponi Baptist Church in Stony Creek, Virginia. We're glad that you're able to join us. Please be sure to like and share and give us a comment to let us know what God is doing in your life. Please go ahead and join us in prayer. Gracious Lord, we thank you for this time that we have together, even though we are separated by time and distance, but we're thankful for the opportunity to gather in this way to worship you. We're thankful for the technology that allows us to do this. And Father, we just ask that you would open our minds, open our hearts, and open our ears to receive your word today. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. On August 18th, 2020, Simon Holland sent a tweet that I would say would resonate with a lot of us. He wrote, don't know about y'all, but I could really go for some precedented times. And I think that many people, particularly now as we're starting to come through this pandemic and we're starting to see the other end, a lot of people are really anxious to get back to the way things were. Yes, if that were so great. I think I have a better idea. What if instead of trying to make the church and even America what they were 13 months ago, what if instead we concentrated on making the church what it was almost 2,000 years ago? In the approximately 30-year period covered by the book of Acts from about 30 to about 62, the church grew exponentially. And what was their secret? Was it a Christian society? Was it government support? Or was it people just wanting to live their lives in ways that glorify God? Well, really it was none of the above. What happened was an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And those who were truly disciples living in obedience to the Word of God. It was that simple and that complicated. The early church had a lot going for it, but it also had a lot working against it. But the gates of hell did not prevail. Now we're going to spend some time over the next several weeks exploring what the Holy Spirit did in the first three decades of the church as recorded in the book of Acts. And so a little background before we get into our scripture reading. Uh, the book of Acts was written possibly as early as about 62 AD, definitely no later than 90. Um, I tend to go for, I tend to believe an earlier date just based on some things that aren't included. It was written by Luke as the second volume to the gospel that known as Luke. So, and you can very much see where Luke picks, where Luke ends, Acts picks up, and there's a whole lot going for it there. Acts doesn't really end. Uh, something that's always kind of fascinated and frustrated us. You know, what happened next? Well, you know, it kind of it kind of leaves off. That tells us that maybe Luke intended there to be a third volume, or maybe it just never got finished. You know, there's all sorts of things, but you know, we don't know why it just doesn't end. But it gives us a great story of about 30 years. And it tells us a lot that connects the four Gospels to the epistles or all the letters that is the rest of the New Testament. They wouldn't all make sense without the book of Acts. Now, a little about Luke. He was a doctor. He was a Gentile. And he was also sometimes a traveling companion of Paul, a co-worker in the faith. Tradition says that he died in the year 84, and another interesting thing with him, and you see this when we get into the reading, that his works are addressed to someone named Theophilus. 
Now, this could have been a real name of an actual person, but the you know the name means one who loves God, and it could be that this was a code, you know, get based on his use of most excellent Theophilus in the Gospel of Luke. It could have been that he was writing to an official and using Theophilus as a code name. We don't know who Theophilus was, but since it means those who love God, we can also read this and learn from it ourselves. So bear all that in mind as we start out our reading in the book of Acts. We're going to start with chapter 1, verse 1. We're going to read through verse 11 today. And Luke writes, I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. The word of the Lord, for the people of the Lord. Let's pray quickly. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for how it has been carefully written and carefully preserved for us. We thank you that we are able to have it in front of us in a language that we understand so that we may learn from it. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, amen. So the first thing we see opening up in the book of Acts, we're going to notice there's a space in between. We start with the space in between the resurrection and the ascension, that period of 40 days. And then there's also a space between the ascension and the receiving of the Holy Spirit. That's another 10 days for a total of 50, but we'll get to that point. But there's a bigger space in between that the apostles were living in, the, the disciples, all, that were, all those that were there, and continuing on through history of where we are today. There is the space in between Christ ascending and taking his seat at the right hand of God and his return in glory coming back to take us home. That space, that space in between, has been going on for nearly 2,000 years now. So, we'll get back to the first little space in between here, this uh, 40 days that Christ walked around the earth and taught after he was resurrected. Now, of course, we celebrated resurrection on Easter Sunday. You remember that. His ascension was 40 days later, and during that, as Luke tells us in, the, in this book, during that time, note Luke says that he gave many convincing proofs 
or your, if you have a King James, it will say many infallible proofs. That's one of the few instances when I actually like the King James's translation a little better. They were real evidence that it, he wasn't just a vision they were seeing. He was real. He had a physical form. He had a body. In fact, Luke gives attention to him walking in, in Luke's gospel here. He gives attention to him walking with the disciples and talking them, to them on the way to Emmaus. He gives attention to him eating fish in the upper room with the disciples. He gives attention to him teaching in that time between his resurrection and his ascension. He uses that space in between to do a couple of things. He uses it first to prove that he really was resurrected. If you may remember, I said on Easter, it was very important to prove that he had been really dead, that his death was our substitutionary atonement. But it was equally important to prove that he was alive afterward. And he did. He showed himself to over 500 people. And in fact, in the beginning here, we can see based on further evidence in Luke, it looks like there were 120 people at this site. You know, we tend to, you know, some of us tend to typically think, well, it was just the 11 or the 12 at that point. But if you look in verse 15, we see during these days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The number of people who were together was about 120. And there's no reason to believe that if these 120 were up in the room following the instructions to be waiting, and praying, that they were there to hear the instructions. There's no reason to believe that was not the case. So they're there, lots of people. They're seeing him, they're hearing him. They're asking him questions. But he's giving his final instructions before he ascends to heaven, before he takes his place at the right hand of the Father. And his instructions are pretty simple. He tells them basically, wait for the Holy Spirit and then go and witness. And they have to do that in that order because they are going to need the power of the Holy Spirit in order to witness. They will not be able to do this of their own strength. Now, the waiting period, in this case, was 10 days. And the reason for that, um, Pentecost was already a Jewish feast. It took place 50 days after Passover. So it was a day coming up when it was one of the big feasts when men from all over all over Judaism, would travel to Jerusalem to observe this feast. So it was a big deal. There were going to be lots of people in Jerusalem at that time. Now, Jesus didn't say, hey, this is going to happen on Pentecost. What he said here was not many days from now. So they didn't, they might have suspected, hey, this will happen at Pentecost. Or they might have just been waiting and watching and praying. And we'll, next week we'll talk about what the disciples do while they wait. But of course, they spend a lot of time in prayer. So there's that space in between that they used for prayer. You know, Jesus used his space in between for instruction, for giving directions, for proving what he had said was true. The 10 days in between that, the disciples use for prayer. But we, besides the space in between, we also have to pay attention to the promise of the Holy Spirit. This is a big one. Now, verse 5, what we read is, For John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. John's baptism was outward and physical. It was an obvious visual sign of people's repentance of their sins. 
Baptism by immersion in a church still serves that purpose today. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit is inward and spiritual. It may not be as obvious to the casual onlooker. People might not be able to see the Holy Spirit in you. But if you're saved, the Holy Spirit has been promised. Now, the disciples, of course, in verse 6, they ask the question, you know, very popular question, Lord, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel at this time? The disciples had always associated the receiving of the Holy Spirit with Christ's earthly reign. And here he was in front of them, resurrected. Death hadn't defeated him. They were expecting him to just go and take a throne and kick Rome out of Jerusalem and establish the kingdom in Israel again. They thought Christ's kingdom on earth had come. There was no real concept of what we call the church age or that period we're living in now because it wasn't mentioned in the Old Testament. Now, the question indicated that they misunderstood the promise of God because it was really hard for them to let go of the idea of Jesus as a political Messiah. You know, they wanted Jesus to, you know, free their country. Maybe we ask the same thing of him. Maybe, maybe he's not a political messiah now. Just thinking. Some things do become abundantly clear from Jesus' instructions, though. The way he says, you know, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, in Samaria, to the, in, uh, to the utmost parts of the earth. It is clear very clear that Jesus wanted everyone reached. He does not want that any should perish, but all to have everlasting life. Now the Holy Spirit, and we'll get more into that as we continue on through the book, but the Holy Spirit is not given to us for our own purposes. It's not to make us look super spiritual or give us any, you know, special supernatural insights or anything that we wouldn't have, the Holy Spirit is provided as a counselor, a comforter, and, and finally, the provider of the power to do the work that God has given us. The Holy Spirit is primarily for demonstrating Christ's power to an unbelieving world. Now, the Holy Spirit, working through the apostles, caused the church to grow massively in 30 years, scattered far and wide. Churches were popping up all over the place. It was amazing. It was truly unprecedented. But it happened. But, you know, we, I say, and I want you to hear this very well, the Holy Spirit working through the apostles. This was not their work, even though they were doing work. It was the Holy Spirit working through them. I know some of you probably, as you opened up your Bibles to the book of Acts, you know, some of you have these translations that will have the title of the book as the Acts of the Apostles. If yours says that, just take a pencil and the words of the apostles, draw a line through that. Because that is not what the book is about. It's clearly not what Luke had said. Clearly, it is about the work of the Holy Spirit. In fact, I'll prove this to you. I wrote this first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up after he'd given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. So, again, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. 
that work continued after his ascension through the work of the Holy Spirit. He did that, the Holy Spirit did that through his disciples. And in fact, um, MacDonald puts it this way. This power is the grand indispensable of Christian witness. A man may be highly talented, intensively trained, and widely experienced, but without spiritual power, he is ineffective. Now think about this. The power of the Holy Spirit turned men who had started their careers as fishermen, just regular working guys, the power of the Holy Spirit turned them into the ones who started the church. So we want to be very careful how we put that together. But aside from the promise of the Holy Spirit, and again, you know, we'll get more into that, that you know, as we go through this book, but today's just an introduction to what we'll be doing. But as we go on, we see we do we are reminded the Holy Spirit is promised to all who are saved. But there's another promise that's received here. And that promise is of Christ's return. Now again, we see that um, while he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going to heaven. I want you to pay very close attention to that. The end of this space in between that we are sitting in right now is Christ's return when he will set up his earthly kingdom. Now, some like to argue, you know, some like to argue for a rapture somewhere in there. I'm not going to argue for or against it. I will just say that there are some things here that are pointed to clear enough in Scripture to me, and we'll take a look at these. One is that he ascended from the Mount of Olives, we see that in verse 12, because it tells where they were, and that he will return to the Mount of Olives, which is actually prophesied in Zechariah 14.4. He ascended personally. He will return personally. He ascended visibly. They watched him go up. And I always picture this in kind of slow motion, like they're just looking. Until he just disappears into the cloud. That's how I've always pictured this. It was long enough for them to go. He will return visibly the same way. Matthew 24, 30 gives a great account. Of his return. He was received in a cloud. He will come back on the clouds. He ascended gloriously. And he will return with power and great glory. Now. Another thing to keep in mind. Because we do know he's coming back. Our Lord. If we accept him as our Lord. Gave his instructions. And then he ascended into heaven. Promising to return. Perhaps it would be best if when he returns that we would be found doing those things that he has commanded. So I've got some questions for you. First, what are you doing with the time that he has given you between the ascension and the return? Whether that's your entire life or whether that is from the time you were born until the time he comes back. What are you doing with that time? Or maybe more importantly, do you believe the witnesses who saw him alive 
and who saw him ascended. Have you received the Holy Spirit? Or maybe another way to put this, in those things that you're doing, are you relying on the power of the Holy Spirit? Or are you relying on your own abilities? I'm going to ask you this week to, a couple of things. I'm going to ask you to go ahead and read through the entire book of Acts. Take you a couple hours. And then I'm going to ask you to commit to those questions that we just asked. Commit to answering those this week. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for the book of Acts, for it telling us things that we need to know, things that we need to understand, for laying out the importance of our mission and the importance of relying on the Holy Spirit for our mission. Father, we just ask that as we go through this week, that you will keep these questions that we've asked in the forefront of our mind. And Father, help us to come to an honest answer to them. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.